let's take a look at what was to be the ultimate high speed, high altitude, and last manned strategic bomber, the XB-70 Valkyrie, an aircraft which still looks futuristic even today. The Valkyrie was a Mach 3 bomber which flew at 70,000 feet, rode its own shockwave, and almost wasn't built. Changing technologies and advancements in weapon systems nearly doomed this aircraft to just a concept design. Faced with numerous challenges and setbacks, the Valkyrie was built and flown just for a completely different purpose from which it was designed. Today we will take a look at the Valkyrie story and the legacy it leaves behind. A big thank you goes out to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. CuriosityStream is my personal favorite streaming service, a place where I can watch thousands of incredibly made documentaries. One that I've been watching recently is Cold War Hot Jets, a two-part series on the dawn of the jet age and the role it played during the early years of the Cold War. There's some great footage and I learned a thing or two about some of the early jet bombers along with the challenges they faced. Additionally, there's an entire section of CuriosityStream's catalog dedicated to military history, which I think you will enjoy. What's amazing is that you can access all of CuriosityStream's documentaries for less than $20 a year, which is less than $2 a month and less than other streaming services. To add even more value and support this channel, go to curiositystream.com tog for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. Use the promo code TOG and you'll save 25% off, which comes out to only $14.99 a year. It's a great way to support this channel and help me make more videos like this one. To understand the Valkyrie, we need to understand the circumstances that led to its inception. The Cold War was perhaps the deadliest chess game ever played on the world stage. Decades of move and counter move, each advancement leading to a direct counter in order to neutralize the newfound advantage. This dangerous game was most evident in strategic bombers. By the early 1950s, bombers had become larger and larger out of necessity. They had to traverse the great distances from the United States to the Soviet Union and deliver nuclear payloads, which weighed tons. From this, two designs emerged. The B-52, which could fly high and far but not fast, and the B-58 Hustler, which could fly fast but not over great distances. Additionally, Soviet interceptors were becoming faster and capable of higher altitudes. The Air Force needed a counter, a bomber that could fly high, fly far, and fly fast. In 1955, the US Air Force issued General Operational Requirement Number 38 for a new bomber, which combined the payload and range of the B-52 along with the speed of the B-58 Hustler. Two companies entered this competition, Boeing and North American Aviation, and interestingly, both initially implemented a similar design strategy. An aircraft which made use of huge wing sections with fuel tanks that could be jettisoned after the fuel was depleted. For context, each of these sections was to be the size of a B-47 medium bomber. The remaining wing was trapezoidal in shape, which at the time was the highest performance platform known, as seen on the F-104 Starfighter. The Starfighter would be forever linked to the Valkyrie, more on that later. As development continued, it was found that a narrow delta wing was the preferred plan form for supersonic flight. Along with this, engines were becoming better able to cope with higher temperatures along with varying intake ramps which allowed for sustained supersonic flight. The designers at North American took things a step further by taking advantage of what became known as compression lift. By using the shock waves generated from sharp points on an aircraft such as the nose, high pressure can be generated which results in increased lift. This explains why the aircraft that would become the Valkyrie would make use of highly angled surfaces, especially at the engine inlets. These design implementations increased lift by as much as 30% as a result. North American also made a key design decision by placing the engines in a single large duct under the fuselage. This streamlined the design further as compared to engine pods, which were common on other bombers of the time. To power the design, North America went with six General Electric YJ-93 GE-3 afterburning turbojets, each which could produce 28,000 pounds of thrust with afterburner. It turns out these improvements almost worked too well. The prototype was almost too fast. As speed increases, the center of pressure or average lift point moves rearward causing instability. Therefore, you have the classic components of a negative feedback loop. Increased speed, nose pitches up. Add trim, nose pitches down, 
introducing control surfaces into the airflow, causing more drag and slowing you down. To solve this, the engineers at North American modified the wings. By enabling the wing tips to be lowered or drooped at high speeds, the usable lifting area of the wings was reduced, which moved the lift point forward and thereby reduced trim drag. This also had the added benefits of increased vertical area, helping the aircraft maintain directional stability and further trapping the induced shockwave. As a result, the aircraft would ride its own shockwave much like a surfer riding on an ocean wave. In late 1957, North American was announced as the winner of the competition. The aircraft was to be designated the B-70 Valkyrie, with a prototype given the XB-70 designation. We have the engines, we have the design. The next major challenge was an obstacle that plagues all fast aircraft, heat. At Mach 3, the aircraft's skin would reach an average temperature of 450 degrees Fahrenheit. The leading edges could hit temperatures of 630 degrees, and the engine compartments could see temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees. North American engineers came up with a solution. Using sandwich panels, where each panel was made up of two thin sheets of stainless steel brazed to opposite faces of a honeycomb-shaped foil core. To cool the interior, the Valkyrie would pump fuel through heat exchangers as it made its way to the engines. The Valkyrie was so advanced that at the time it was being called the last man bomber. However, just as the prototype was under construction, the program was dealt a severe blow. The Valkyrie was designed to fly high and fast, higher and faster than interceptors at the time could reach. In fact, during the late 1950s when the Valkyrie was being designed, Soviet interceptors could not intercept the high-flying but much slower U-2 reconnaissance aircraft. Ironically, it was an incident involving a U-2 that would lead to the Valkyrie's cancellation. In 1960, a U-2 was shot down while overflying the Soviet Union and made the world aware of a new weapon, the surface-to-air missile or SAM. Missiles had many advantages over interceptors. They could be immediately launched without having to prepare a pilot for flight. They were much faster and flew higher than any manned fighter at the time. The very advantage that the Valkyrie had been designed to exploit had been neutralized. To counter the high-flying SAMs, bombers and fighters had to fly at very low altitudes. And while the Valkyrie could do this, its speed performance was not much better than the B-52, and there was a huge range penalty flying in the lower and denser air. Another blow to the XP-70 program was the introduction of Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, nuclear-tipped rockets that could fly halfway around the globe. This not only made the Valkyrie obsolete as a bomber, but also put every other manned bomber's future in jeopardy. In 1961, the B-70 program was cancelled, and the Valkyrie seemed to be regulated to another concept aircraft that never flew. However, there was hope on the horizon. Fortunately for the Valkyrie, just as the missile theory was gaining supporters and man bombers were being deemed obsolete, the commercial aviation world was starting to take an interest in supersonic flight. The jet age had cut commercial flight times in half compared to propeller-driven aircraft, and supersonic transports, or SSTs, promised the same improvement over subsonic jet airliners. By the early 1960s, NASA already had several SST studies underway most notably with a modified North American F-100 and A-5A. The Valkyrie was the perfect testbed for SST research. The XP-70 already used similar structural materials such as titanium and bray stainless steel honeycomb. And more importantly, the Valkyrie was the same size as projected SST designs. Its fuselage was 185 feet. The first XB-70A aircraft was named Air Vehicle 1 or AV-1, and made its maiden flight in 1964. An amazing and futuristic aircraft, there simply was nothing like it in the world. Throughout 1964 and 1965, both North American and Air Force pilots conducted airworthiness tests and flights in AV-1. Interestingly, a TB-58 would escort the Valkyrie during testing as it could attain speeds of Mach 2. Flight trials continued, yet despite its design advantages, AV-1 was found to have poor directional stability above Mach 2.5, and as a result only made a single flight above Mach 3. Still, these early flights provided invaluable SST data 
such as aircraft noise, control system design, and actual high altitude performance. These findings would contribute greatly to future designs. More on that later. The findings from AV-1 were taken into account and applied to the second prototype, designated AV-2. The most noteworthy improvement was the addition of 5 degrees of dihedral to the wings, which greatly improved high-speed handling. These changes proved themselves in flight tests, with AV-2 achieving Mach 3 in early 1966. By June of that year, AV-2 had made 9 Mach 3 flights. Despite not being used for its intended bomber role, the XP-70 was proving itself as a valuable testbed for the commercial airline industry. Given the successful performance demonstrated by AV-2, the Air Force and NASA signed a joint agreement to use the second prototype for more high-speed flights in support of the SST program. Plans were in the works to evaluate AV-2 on typical SST flight profiles, along with studying sonic booms on overland flights. Then, the unthinkable happened. On June 8, 1966, five aircraft took to the skies for a formation photo shoot. These five aircraft, an F-4, an F-5, a T-38, an F-104, and the XB-70 all had one thing in common. Their engines were made by General Electric. The newer and more improved AV-2 was chosen as the aircraft to represent the XB-70 program. GE requested the photo op and just as the last pictures were being taken, the F-104 flown by NASA Chief Test Pilot Joe Walker drifted near AV-2's right wingtip. Evidently, Walker had been focusing on the fuselage of the Valkyrie to maintain his position to the right and below. Without uncomfortably turning his head, Walker was unable to properly perceive his motion relative to the Valkyrie. The F-104 continued to drift closer, unaware of the subtle shift in position until tragically it was caught in AV-2's wake vortex. This caused the F-104 to flip and roll inverted over the top of the Valkyrie, striking the bomber's vertical stabilizers and left wing. The F-104 exploded, killing Walker instantly. The Valkyrie flew on for 16 seconds until it entered an uncontrollable spin and crashed just north of Barstow, California. AV-2's pilot Al White ejected but sadly, co-pilot Carl Cross did not make it out. The loss of AV-2 had massive consequences for the research program. As stated before, AV-2 was the more improved XB-70, and while AV-1 was undergoing modifications at the time of AV-2's accident, it never attained the speeds demonstrated by AV-2. Following the accident, a total of 11 research flights occurred with AV-1 attaining a maximum speed of Mach 2.57 during this time. After further maintenance and downtime, AV-1 was turned over to NASA, where research flights continued with modifications to reduce effects of turbulence and atmospheric temperature changes. Despite this, time was running out for the Valkyrie. NASA had reached an agreement with the Air Force to fly research missions with two YF-12As and a prototype SR-71. These new jets could log as much time at Mach 3 in a single flight as the XP-70s had in all of their combined flights. The era of the Valkyrie had come to an end. For an aircraft that nearly did not get built, the Valkyrie blazed the trail unlike any other in aviation history. To this day, the XP-70 remains the world's largest high-speed experimental aircraft and still holds the record for the largest and heaviest aircraft to ever fly at Mach 3. Beginning its life as a strategic bomber, the Valkyrie made immense contributions to supersonic commercial flight. Other SST testbeds followed the XP-70s, including the aforementioned YF-12 and the iconic F-16XL, both which increased the knowledge base for supersonic transports. The commercialized SST Concorde directly benefited from these programs, and SST technology is once again at the forefront of aviation research, almost 60 years after the first XB-70 flew. Additionally, the Valkyrie's contributions are not just limited to the commercial sector. Hypersonic weapons are at the forefront of military technology today, and could change the way conflicts unfold in the near future. Compression lift and riding shockwaves are of high importance to hypersonic weapons. After all, Boeing's X-51 missile has been named the Wave Rider for a reason. 
The last flight of the Valkyrie occurred on February 4, 1969, where the sole remaining XP-70 was flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Today, AV-1 is on display at the National Museum of the Air Force. If you have a chance to go, visit and see the bomber that changed history. Thanks for watching, and thanks again to CuriosityStream for offering a 25% discount to Pilot Photog viewers.